Okay, so um, uh, we're uh, very lucky to have, uh, uh, following on from Oliver, Richard Durbin, who was certainly a collaborator on some of those earlier works, and is a senior group leader at the Sanger Center. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was kind of uh, intimidating enough to sort of talk here, but actually given all the talks, I felt like there's a very high standard. It's an amazing set of, t of topics that we've heard about in presentations uh, to, to follow. Um, so I sort of streamlined my title, actually. This is a much simpler and, I think, uh, more directly relevant title as well. And I want to say a, a few words about David. Um, I've interacted with David in kind of parallel career pathways for nearly 20 years. Uh, but actually, I, we've never published anything together. I, I had to. I was a bit surprised at that. I had to check uh, PubMed or <laughs> various citation locations. Um, we've certainly had a lot of interesting discussions, uh, which I think have probably contained things that would have been worth publishing, or maybe did something came of them. Um, and uh, there've been the, the only formal interaction I think we've had is that my student Leo Parts was you were his nom nominal university second supervisor. I, he, he, I think he actually he used to come along and spend time in the inference group and gained a lot from that. Uh, but actually, Ollie, who just spoke, when he was your student, he, he worked quite a lot with our group. And um, uh, we, we had joint papers from that, as, we, as Neil just mentioned, but um, without you being directly involved. Uh, the first, when, when I first met you was in, I was a postdoc in working on neural nets, on actually multi-layer networks in David Rommelhart's group at Stanford. And uh, David arrived as a graduate student with John Hopfield and um, made, started making big sort of waves as, a, as an early graduate student about, in thinking about Bayesian uh, uh, inference and the relationship of that to neural nets. And unlike other people who have said that they were converted strongly by this, actually my memory is I, I argued with you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not to my benefit, but actually arguing is a good way to learn, and I, I learned a huge amount through that. And um, uh, so that was um, on that stage. And I wanted to say, say one other thing. So then we both came back to Cambridge, and uh, and we actually uh, did collaborate and worked a little bit on protein structure prediction and uh, uh, or, or using secondary long-range information to in, in trying to identify and use long-range information in protein. I think we allowed ourselves to let the best be the enemy of the good there. There were some interesting things that actually subsequently people have, have worked on that we didn't, that nothing came of at the time. Um, and then there've been all these threads in genetics and, uh, and multiple areas. One thing that I think people have mentioned, of course, your two books, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to kind of have a bit of focus on them. I think it's quite remarkable, really, for, to, to, for scientists to write books like this that really have such a, I mean, many people in this room have an influence on the field. Many people in this room have uh, had a direct interaction with David or a secondary one. And that's a sort of standard means of, um, of influence in science. And people write papers, but actually papers, uh, of course, also have, have impact. But they're often little pieces and uh, incremental. And I think uh, these two books both really capture in a kind of coherent, thought out, well, uh, 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 a, long, you know, a line of argument and a, and a, and a worldview which um, has had enormous impact, actually, in, 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 in those two different fields. And it's, there's a real, uh, something, it draws together special properties of, of David, but there's something very uh, remarkable and admirable about that. And I think that's a, a great, um, achievement done not once but twice, uh, uh, really changing those two very different areas that we've been hearing about. So I want to talk about genome sequence data information. Well, we're in a remarkable time in biology when people are sequencing genomes, and you know, Brendan sort of rightly said we can't yet interpret it all, but I think you shouldn't let that get in the way of the impact and the influence of the ability to obtain genome sequence and the way that's changed biology. And it, you know, it, it is a... a it was about uh, 20 years ago. So actually, it's 25 years ago. I've, I've known David since the late 80s. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, the first genome was two megabases. Within five years or so, a, th a factor of 1,000 more. 
the 1,000 Genomes Project, uh, in fact, published uh, 5,000 genomes, uh, two genomes each were deployed. We've got two copies for each of 2,500 people uh, 10 years later. And the cost dropped from a billion dollars to a thousand dollars. That's a, a million fold difference in, in 20 years. Um, and that's, uh, that, that, that's a consistent factor of two per year, which is, is twice the rate of Moore's law, which is um, a tough thing to, to, to work with. And genomic data is information. It's obviously information the way that we handle it. Uh, actually, the limiting factor in the technology often is computational in obtaining genomic sequence data, but also it's information you know, from the biological point of view. So Watson and Crick, you know, realized this uh, uh, only uh, 65 years ago now, or which isn't that long, but, but it's, it's at the heart of population genetics and evolution and, and life in some sense. I think a modern, at least one modern view of life very much, it ties together metabolic and you know, biochemical side, but also an information side. Um, but then also the way that we use genomic data is, is compute limited uh, and it's doubling every year, our ability to acquire information and compute power only doubles every two years and that, you know, that's an endless, and there's no real sign of that falling off, I don't think, uh, and that's an endless, means there's an endless struggle to become more and more smart in the way that we handle um, the data and make use of it. And the thing that saves us is that um, because of biology, because we're all related, every, all our sequences are related, the more sequences we obtain, the more closely they're related to something we've seen before. So the total amount of novelty doesn't increase as fast as the total amount of ability to capture sequence. And we have to leverage that all the time, and we have to use you know, uh, uh, ways of capturing in things about all the information we've seen before and use that in our interpretation of new information, which is very much at the heart of the sorts of things that David has had such a, an influence on uh, you know, over his uh, career. Um, so we need fast algorithms. We also need to be efficient because just as we heard at the computer chip to chip level uh, at the beginning of the day, it's, it's really important when you're dealing with very large amounts of data to be efficient. So we need fast algorithms. We need to compress the data so that we can represent it. And uh, there are two areas that uh, this is important in, both in the sort of scientific area, at the bottom of genetic data and variation analysis, and in, and in just data processing. And I want you to give sort of two uh, stories which are related will flow into each other. The first actually is the bottom one, inference of population history from genome sequences, how we can look at genomic variation and find out something about ourselves scientifically. And the second one has to do with imputation of missing data and sequence correction. Um, so if we obtain partial information about some, a sequence, can we fill in the missing data there uh, from all the other things we've seen? So if we look at people's genome sequences, they're, they're nearly but not quite the same. This is actually the reference genome. This is a very old slide. Reference genome for about 1,000 bases and Craig Venter and Jim Watson's uh, personal genomes, and wherever there's a dot, they're the same, and they're nearly the same. There's a few whited out regions, um, and in fact, there's just one place where they differ here, uh, but they both differ at the same place, which is telling you something interesting, um, uh, and um, that's actually typical. I mean, uh, about one in a thousand differences across the genome, with three billion bases long, there are about three million differences between any two copies. Oh, we each have two copies. So between your maternal and paternal copy, there's about uh, three million differences. And most of that variation is shared in some. And the reason it's shared is that we're descended uh, from a common ancestor. There's some sort of tree. This is uh, 32 leaves, and there's a tree that relates them. You can see it has a kind of interesting structure where it branches a lot at the bottom. Um, and you get a difference when there's been a mutation in the past when at some point on that tree, you can put a cross, like that blue cross, and uh, then some number of people will have a different version of the sequence than the other number of people. Um, and many of those mutations happen because the branch lengths are high, uh, quite long, high up, the tree, high up the tree, and then they'll be shared. So there's three people here who differ from the other 20, 29. There's a, there's a mutation here that splits one-third, two-thirds, and so on. 
And so each variant will have an allele frequency. And some mutations may be associated with disease or with some other phenotype, and uh, this leads to the sort of association correlation studies that uh, Brendan was mentioning. Um, and one can use that to, to, to use genetics as a tool. But I'm not really going to talk about that very much in this uh, talk. So, so we need to think about trees if we're going to look at, think about genomic variation. It's fairly clear. And the simplest tree is the tree on two sequences. And you may think that's a trivial tree because at some point they have to have a common ancestor, but there's a key variable there, which is time. You don't know when that common ancestor was. And so actually in the 1940s, uh, Gustav Muller started talking about having two different sequences now, A and B at the bottom, and thinking about going backwards in time, that should be negative time, to a most recent common ancestor. And that called coalescence. And if you think about it, what's the chance that, you know, if you've got two copies, what's the chance that they share a common ancestor one generation ago. Well, you can think of them as picking a parent out of the, all the possible parents in the population. And that if they're n parents, there's a one over n chance that they'll pick the same parent. So the distribution of time to the common ancestor is exponentially distributed with mean n. That's the, the sort of simple model. And it's a remarkably good model. And that gives you a whole set of for those of you who know population genetics, this is a trivial slide, but it's a kind of nice intro. Uh, the genetic difference is due to mutation on one of the branches. The probability of an observed mutation is twice the time times the mutation rate, uh, because there's two copies, and where well, the t is generations. So the expected number which of differences is uh, this thing theta pi. That's just the symbol for the expected number of differences that we use, the or the observed number of differences is 2n mu, because we saw that n is t is, is n in this model. In humans, we're diploid. We've got, uh, so if we have n people, we have 2n copies. So it's 4n mu. And that's a very famous equation. And n is the effective population size. And for humans, theta is about 1 in 1,000. Varies a bit depending on the population. So it's actually hard to measure mu and n independently. But we can, we can now pretty well measure mu. It's about 10 to the minus 8 per generation. And we can observe that that means there's about 25,000 people in the world, which is, uh, is clearly wrong. <laughs> and there are various reasons why that's wrong, um, partly because there are fewer people in the past than there were now, and also because we don't select our parents randomly. Um, and there may have been selection. Uh, but uh, in some sense, there's this relationship between <coughs> diversity and and time and numbers of people that we can, we, we, we're going to make use of. And there's one other thing I want to talk about. What about recombination? So we looked at one tree. But actually, it's not true that we have the same tree relating our genomes uh, everywhere in the genome. If the genome is this linear thing, and it's actually split into chromosomes. Um, if points on the genome are very close, if they're adjacent, then they pretty much have the same tree. If they're far apart, if they're on different chromosomes, those will be independent trees sampled from this distribution. And what happens in between? Well, you get a kind of smearing. You know, actually, there is a, there's, a, there's a probabilistic structure to the relationship between the trees. And that occurs because of the recombination. You get recombination events. So we have two, two different genomes, a red one on the left and a blue one on the right. Maybe your grandmother and your grandfather. And your mother, the copy of your genome you got from your mother was made out of part of your grandfather's and part of your grandmother's. They were, there was a cut point, and they were glued together. And that means to, to the left of this, of this point, the left of this point in your genome here, to this side, you're, you were red from this person, and to the right, you were blue from this person. And those, those two were pretty independent. So there's this random cutting. And if we, look, if we look along a longer piece of genome, that means that your genome is made of segments. Or if you look at pair, a pair here at the bottom, the common ancestor is piecewise constant separated by jumps. So the jumps are recombinations that happen at some point in your ancestor. So there'll be some history of the common ancestor that runs along. And this genome, remember, runs along for 3 billion bases. And there will be you know, hundreds of thousands of these jumps that have happened at some point in the past. And this really matters, because if you had a common ancestor, as in this region, a long time ago, then there'll be a lot of mutations. There'll be a lot of differences. And if you have a common ancestor recently, like this, the mutation rate 
the observed difference weight is very small because T is small. So actually, the differences don't fall randomly. They cluster. They cluster because of this structure here. And we could make use of that structure to tell us something about when the common ancestor was. We can look, look at the clustering information. So how would we do that? We can, we can infer history from the differences. And essentially, we have this left to right process. We can think running on the genome. We have differences in blue and places where you're the same. No, differences in red, places where you're the same in blue. And we have a hidden state. We have something that we can't observe, the, the coalescence time, which determines the rate at which we see differences in the, in, the, in the sequence. So we have an observable at the bottom here, an observable sequence, and it's, it's dependent on a hidden state for its, its structure. So we can fit, we can use a hidden Markov model where, we, where the, we have a single state, which is the coalescent time, or a, or a set of states, a, a linear, a, an array of states, a one-dimensional space of states, uh, and we get transitions between them. And um, so that seems kind of OK. How do we work out what the transition probabilities are? The emission probabilities are simple. The probability of a difference depends upon the, the time, linearly. Probability of recombination also depends upon on the time of, of breaking it. That's, that's the chance that there's one of these breakpoints happen. This is a bit more complicated. The next row, I'm not going to go through it. But we can derive that from coalescent theory. From It's actually quite straightforward. And it depends upon the population size history. If the population size was small, the chance is that you jump, you're, you jump to a, a, more, a time that was, uh, well, the, the chance of coalescing is, is higher when the population size is small. And the chance of coalescing is, is, is less when the population size is large. So we can fit the population size by looking at this data. We have a, we can convert, well basically there's a, there's a one parameter uh, or one dimensional set of things which are interesting to us, the population size of the, the history of the population size of, of, the pop, of humans. So here's an example of fitting such a model. We can simulate data uh, with a thin black line and you can see that you can fit it quite well. This and there's a, there's a whole set of theory. We, we, and uh, we can implement that as, as software that's relatively efficient because it's a hidden Markov model. And what happens when we look at one person with it? Well, here we have uh, on the bottom the number of generations going backwards in time. So this is really time, logarithmic scale. And this is the population size. And you can see it's not constant. You can see that it's very small here. That's about 1,000, 2,000 generations ago. That's about uh, 30,000, 60,000 years ago. That was when this person, who's actually a nation, left Africa. Oh, well, not they didn't. Their, their, their ancestors did, when their ancestors did. You can see that more recently, a few hundred generations ago, it's a few thousand years ago, the population size went up to a huge level, which is actually rather well ill-defined. And then there's other things that happened going back in the past. And this is actually the number of coalescences. When the population size was small, historically, then there was, it was just a few thousand people, effectively, who left Africa. We, now, we can see from this. There was a high chance that you shared a, com shared a parent, the two copies. So there were lots of coalescences. Here, there was a dip. And that corresponds to this structure. So we can now look at a whole range of different peoples. And we get different lines. And those are different peoples around the world have different population histories. Um, in Europeans and Asians, we all left Africa. Uh, um, the Africans uh, uh, had a, a bit of a lower level, but much less than the Europeans and Asians. Um, there's a second bottleneck, this light green line, actually, people in the Na Na Native Americans, they had a bottleneck going across the, uh, the land bridge, the Bering Strait, about 20,000 years ago. Um, this was the Out of Africa event. Sorry, these are times at the top here now. Uh, th up here, this is the rise of anatomically modern humans about 180, 200,000 years ago. And you can see all these lines come together, and behind them, they're all the same, which is kind of good. There was one sort of ancestral population out of which modern populations arose. Within Africa, there's different histories. 
Uh, we have a couple of lines down here. These turn out, these are not modern humans. These are Neanderthals and Denisovans. We've obtained their genome sequences now. And it's quite interesting to see that their populations plummeted uh, when they left Africa 400,000 years ago, and then they never really recovered. They didn't do what, what's happened to us. Um, and they died off at, around this point. And um, this is, now there's something interesting here. This sort of suggests that there was a big increase in population size around the time of the origin of modern humans. Actually, an alternative is that there were different sets of humans who lived in different, different places and then came back together again. There was population structure, and that would also give rise to this. So there's some kind of interesting interactions here with archaeology and, and other uh, data. Okay, so, so that's what you can do with two sequences, which is sort of remarkable that you can, with two sequences, extract this by looking at the, thinking about the distribution of, of differences. What happens if you add more sequences? Well, then it's quite simple. There's a whole lot of nice theory. John Kingman in 1980 introduced coalescence on multiple sequences. Um, you know, if you've got n, then there's n, n minus 1 over 2 different ways, or i of them, i, i minus 1 over 2 different ways of uh, uh, different pairs, who each of those pairs could have shared a parent in the previous generation. Um, so going from the bottom, you can take a sequence of events where there's a random pair coalesce uh, with this um, uh, in exponential distribution with mean 2n over, over i, i minus 1. And that's you know, quadratically decreasing as i gets bigger. So that's why you had all these early coalescences in the picture I showed you earlier, all these, all these things joining up at the bottom, um, and then long branches at the top. Because the, these, if you think about these as epochs, the epochs at the bottom are all close together, and then there are larger epochs right at the ancient part of the tree. So the first coalescences are very recent. They're, and that's kind of good, because I told you before that the, the, the two-sequence model doesn't tell us much, actually. It doesn't tell us much this side of 20,000 years or 25,000 years. If we want to look at recent history, we have to look at more, at more sequences. Unfortunately, inference on trees with recombination is hard. These are called ancestral recombination graphs. There's a natural generative model for them. Uh, again, Kingman was involved, and, and Simon Tavare, who's here, and uh, Bob Griffiths from Oxford. And um, there is a Markovian approximation. It's very good. But it's a very ill-determined system. There are many, many different histories which could explain data. And to give you some sort of feel, here's some data. Um, here's a tree that satisfies the first two columns. There's no way to satisfy this third column uh, with this tree. There's no way to put a mutation on this tree which would separate... Um, the first and third, A and C, from B and D. Uh, but there's lots of other trees that could do that. Here's one example. And here's a possible history where the C sequence to the right of, some point, of this point looked like that tree, and to the left of it looked like that tree. So there's, we can draw it like this, and we get this structure that's a little more complicated than a tree. It's a sort of tree upwards and downwards, and... Um, uh, there's a distribution over these things, and it's complicated, though elegant. Um, so if you try and parameterize that space, it becomes very large very rapidly. We don't have this business of a tree on two sequences just being the time. So one thing we can do, though, is we can ask what's the first coalescence between any pair, the very first event that happens. And that's not so bad. There's order m squared if there's m haplotypes or m sequences times time states, and um, uh, there's some nice properties of this running backwards, which I don't have time to go into. So we can approximate all the probabilities under that. Stefan Schiffels did that as a student. It's approximate compared to the first one, which is essentially exact. But this lets us look at more recent history. We can look here at the last. These are in years, few thousand years. We can see these are the, uh, these are the Native Americans with the Bering Straits. Uh, these are the Europeans, and the Asians actually separate here, um, the bl bluey ones. And the bluey ones are, I think, the Japanese and Chinese, and they increase more recently. And the um, Europeans increase over the last few thousand years in different ways. Actually, the Southern Europeans increase earlier than the Northern Europeans in population size. So you can start to tease things apart and also... But a second important thing we can do once we have more sequences is look at 
different populations. We can have the first coalescence being, we've got four, two from, say, Britain and two from Italy. The first coalescence could be here, or it could be here, or it could be in the, the common ancestor of the Britons, British and the Italians, maybe 10,000 years ago when the Neolithic farmers came into Europe. Um, and we can ask, how often does this happen compared to this? And that tells us something about the separation time. And we can get a, effectively a measure of separation time. So as well as looking at individual population histories, we can now look at the history of the relationship between them. And there's a whole lot of curves here. And a nice property of this is it's not, you're not fitting a sort of fixed model. They separated for good at one time. You're fitting a, a sort of um, a model that allows you to have arbitrary histories of, 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 of migration and separation. Um, in this picture, these are the everybody from the Africans, basically. Uh, no, let's see. Well, from the Yoruba, from the West Africans. These are from the East Africans. Um, maybe this is a good. Here we have the, the British from the Italians. These are the Chinese from the Japanese, about a bit further ago. And these are the Indians from the Europeans on one side and the Chinese on the other side. And we can look at, it appears that the separation within Africa, we can see signs of separation within Africa before the East Africans left Africa. So we can build this kind of uh, history with ongoing gene flow between populations. OK. So that's, that's one use of thinking about the probability distribution over sequences that we can get out of data. You know, how else might we use them? Um, another use of having a data set of sequences is to understand the error correction and imputation of missing data, to, to handle better new, new data on individuals. Although it costs 1,000 pounds a genome, we're told now it's, um, uh, well, firstly, people are greedy. You always want more. So 100,000 is 100 million, and that's a lot. And um, it would be nice if it was cheaper. Uh, and secondly, we have a lot of data from the past, which was incomplete data. And in fact, it's still true that at that 1,000 pounds of genome, it's not perfect. There are errors. And one wants to think about how to uh, inform our analysis. Maybe we, can, maybe we can fix some of the errors. So we'd like to efficiently learn about the distribution of all possible human genome sequences. From examples, we can get quite a lot of examples now, certainly in the tens of thousands. And we could then use that for prediction, uh, for um, compression, representation, efficient representation, and error correction. And um, so an example, actually another example of, a, of an important problem is that I told you before, I mean, we, we know we each have two copies of the genome, one from your mother, one from your father. The standard way to sequence somebody's genome just gives you the sum of those two. If you represent them as some set of zeros and ones, um, we're basically observing the sum. And if we want to infer the two copies, we have this, you know, what seems at first sight to be a, an impossible task of given a sum of two uh, arrays, what are the two arrays? Well, there's a nice non-negativity property. I mean, they're either so if it's zero, then you know that they were both zero. If it's two, you know they were both one. But if the sum is one, then one of them was one and one was zero, and you, know what, you don't know which was which. But if you have a good picture of the distribution, actually there are most likely sequences, which would be the two sequences who, who are most like, which are most likely to have produced the, uh, the final sequence. And that's a, it's a really important problem, actually. It's a sort of deep problem in a lot of uh, genomic uh, science inference. And to do that well, we need to have some implicit or explicit representation of the distribution. But in this case, you know, these are very long vectors with millions of, of sites. Uh, there are trade-offs between you know, better models and more data, which I think are common in machine learning. Um, and uh, so, with, but with this sort of interesting structure. So here's a motivation example. This is uh, what in human genetics, we call imputation. We have a reference set of sequences, as shown here. So these are individual sequences, maybe from the 1,000 Genomes Project or the 
UK 10K is a British 10,000 genomes. We're, we have this now 100,000 genomes project, but for now we have, say, of the order of 10,000 sequences. Um, and this is data that we've obtained from high throughput genetic studies. And there, what they did is they just took a few places which differ, um, about one every uh, 3,000 bases, actually. So it's quite sparse. Um, they're fairly informative. They picked sites that were informative. Uh, but, and we have data like that for millions of individuals. So what we would like to do is fill in the missing data. We'd like to know what the value at this position is of these individuals. And essentially, the way we do that is we look for matches. We look for, and this is a sort of cartoon, you know, this particular person here, we, we imagine we're phased, actually. We, we've decided this person we split into two sequences. Uh, so we've solved that problem. Um, uh, this matches that blue one here. And this green one matches that green one at the subset of sites that are assayed. And then if you can make that match, then you can just copy down the missing information. So that's a sort of fairly crude thing to do. Um, and especially if you're allowed short matches, you can match to lots of different things. So there's a probabilistic version of that, where you look for the longest matches you can, essentially, and you allow a model which switches, which runs along, essentially, and switches to something else. And so there are these hidden Markov model, first match copy type models, like, rather like my first match method, which jumped around to a different first match. That's essentially what we're doing here. We're looking for matches from uh, between this, these sequences and the ones in the reference panel. So that's got a sort of linear in length, but it's quadratic, actually, especially if you're phasing at the same time in, um, in the number of sequences. And we're always wanting to do this with bigger reference panels. And it's not going to scale to millions of samples. Already, these are very heavy calculations. They take, uh, well, millions of compute hours have been used in the world for these sorts of operations. So we'd like to speed that up. Um, here's an example. We, we've actually been involved in about a couple of years ago. This was essentially all the whole genome sequences available, about 35,000, order of magnitude more data than previous sets. We put together a reference panel. Um, and we, it's heavy to use, but there's two problems with people using it. One is it's heavy to use computationally, but also there's a privacy problem. We got all these different groups to agree to give us the data, but some of them, for example, won't let their data come out of Europe. You know, others uh, don't want people to get their data for other reasons. There are conditions that were attached to the um, uh, the original consents of the patients. So we've got all this useful data. We've got, processed it together. Everyone is happy for us to use it for imputation because imputation doesn't really reveal much about the individuals. It tells you about the new sequence in principle, but they don't want us to give it to people. So we set up servers. We've got two servers now, one in uh, Michigan and one at Sanger Institute. Between them, they've served up over 4 million imputations. Um, there are probably some duplicates there, people doing things in both places or doing things more than once, but you know, there's a very large amount of data being processed. And we are looking at other sorts of parallel operations. So for Sanger, we wanted to think of a new scalable way that we could do this. And I told you that, the, that this process is right out of matching. So we, set a, we thought about an algorithmic process for efficient matching. So rather than match your sequence to everything separately in the reference panel, there's a lot of structure in the reference panel. There are things that are related within the panel. There's not a lot of point in matching. In some sense, intuitively, you shouldn't have to match a new test sequence independently to each reference sequence. Um, on the other hand, if you try to cluster it, it's a bit awkward because everything is unique when you look on a long enough scale. So there's, you know, what scale do you use? So it turns out there are these structures, uh, suffix array-based structures in computer science uh, related to there's this thing called the Burroughs-Wheeler transform, which is actually the basic basis of BZIP. as a compression algorithm. It was introduced for compression. And it can also be used for efficient matching uh, because these things turn out to be related. And essentially what we do here is we have a set of aligned sequences, and there's, I think, 30 of them here. And if you sort them at this position, then it's quite easy to find the best match. You know, it's like looking yourself up in a phone book. It's much easier to find your address 
somebody in the London phone book if it's sorted than if it's um, ran in random order. Uh, so if we sort it, then we can, but we need it sorted at every position in the genome, and that might seem a bad thing, because you don't want to have a separate phone book for each position. But those are, in fact, very closely related. You can go along updating your sort order, and there's two, so there's an efficient way to sort at every position in the genome. And secondly, if you now look at the next position, that now is no longer, this next position is, these are not essentially independent because it's predictive, because if two things are similar, so the red here indicates that these two sequences are identical. So the red is an indication of how much the, each row is identical to the previous row. So this red row is identical uh, for that long to the previous row. And if you get things that are identical this, up to some point, then it's quite likely that the next position will be identical. So the values in this column, if you sort from this position leftwards, are correlated. And we can compress using that, and we can predict using that, and fill in missing data using that, it turns out. So this is analog analogous to the Burroughs-Wheeler transform, which is used now by a lot of uh, fast sequence matching methods. Um, and the values in the next column are highly correla correlated. So we can show, how am I doing for time? I'm out. OK. Um, we, can, we can compress with this. We can simulate data from 1,000 to 100,000. This is the factor which we do better than gzip in compression, 100-fold better. Um, for real data, 10 to 12-fold better. We can also match now, if we do naive matching it, that's proportional to the number of sequences present, scales. But we can now match in time that's independent of the number of sequences. We can find the best match independent of the size of the reference panel. Um, and uh, it just relies on an index, essentially. It's slightly less accurate, but uh, so this is an accuracy plot. This is a allele frequency. Red is the 1,000 genomes data. It's with 1,000. This is with 30,000 sequences with the best method. Blue is with our, our method. It's closer to the black than the red, but it's using 55 seconds um, rather than two hours, uh, and it's using 87 megabytes rather than nine gigabytes of, of data on a small sample. And in fact, we can do it all in one job, and they have to split it up and put it across a farm and, and process back. So really, there's a, a speed advantage there. So I'm going to finish that last slide. Um, I mean, these are both things I think I've talked about, about using the distribution of, of, of genetic sequences. Uh, I think there's a lot of mileage. It matters a lot for us to understand and be able to compute effectively with, the, with genetic sequences, with the genome sequences. These are two sort of slightly half-baked ideas, and I'm, this is such a kind of rich audience, I thought I would throw them out there. Um, so the first is the PBWT was constructed actually for computational reasons originally, uh, but we can use it for inference, and I'm interested in you know, are there sort of Bayesian probabilistic interpretation of algorithms and search methods as well as of representations? People tend to think about probabilistic distributions over representations, but I think there's an algorithmic aspect that's interesting as well. Um, and that's, I'm not quite sure how. And the second is to do with privacy preservation. It occurs to me, if we built a good machine learning approach for imputation or for phasing, then we could can that capture the value of the sequences for the task, but not reveal what they are? At the moment, our methods all re reveal, rely on having a, a complete set of sequences there, which you can match. So we can't export them to somebody else they, who, who would use them in other ways or combine them with other things. We have to have this server. But can we, in some sense, capture the structure of the distribution in a way which doesn't reveal the individual sequences which contributed? possibly with a little degradation, but control that in some fashion. And maybe uh, some of these you know, deep learning network ideas can do that. Um, and that, I think, would be very fruitful in genetics, where we're always being constrained by this, these privacy issues, and maybe that. So thanks. So questions? Just a question about these imputed sequences. Um, you gave the impression that 
you, you submit your query to your server and you get back a, a, a sequence with everything yep. filled in, is it not sort of probabilistic? It yeah, so you get back actually a, um, you get back a best guess sequence for your entire genome sequence. So you put in something. In fact, if you have a 23andMe data, as Brendan said, you can take that. We have a special, take that in the format they give it to you in and upload it and get back your full genome sequence. So this thing that's tested at 700,000 sites becomes 3 billion. Uh, but it gives you an estimate of the, of the error at each position. Um, and you know, how well calibrated, I mean, the issues about calibration of that and uh, uh, you could sample under various models. Some of the models you could sample under and have a set of samples. That would be an alternative. I presume um, you've got to be pretty careful about what you do with it, not, uh, to, not to assume that it's correct. You might be missing some, some And of course, months. also if you've measured your sequence, you know, you could leave out half of it and impute it and then see where you're, it's very confident that it's something different from what you have. And then it's either likely that you've got an error on your measurement or, or a recent mutation. And there's a whole set of issues there about error correction as well. Uh, so do you store the um, sequence user you've inferred or uh, do you delete? We delete everything that was sent because that's the yeah. sort of conditions on which people, um, that's kind of a shame slightly because there's a lot of information in these millions of people's genomes that are being imputed. So one of the, you know, there's a whole sociology of the science of genetics. And this is very important for medical uses of genetics. For example, the UK 100,000 Genomes Project, since there are sort of policy things, which the prime minister, you know, espoused and, uh, but as he attached to that the condition that your data will be absolutely safe and that nothing would ever leave the UK. Of course, the value often is in finding a match. Let's say that you have a child with a rare genetic disease, genetic disease and they have oh, you know, thousands of mutations. What would be perfect, uh, you know, what you want is to find somebody else, possibly in Arizona or in uh, India, who has the same mutation and the same disease. And then, uh, firstly, that can confirm the diagnosis. And secondly, you can put your, you know, you can be put as a parent in touch with the parents of the other child. In, and you can find out what works for them and how they're, and uh, these things are known to be important in rare disease genetics or in disease genetics. And the current UK policy completely forbids the ability, well, at least the UK policy is that everybody else should send us all their data. <laughs> but that doesn't, um, <laughs> it's not a symmetric relationship. And there's a lot of problems with data sharing. So finding good ways to share appropriately is a parallel issue to finding good computational methods. Okay. So if there's uh, no other questions, can we just thank Richard again? So I was struck particularly by one of the things Richard said about uh, these small populations leaving Africa. And uh, it sort of feels a bit like looking back on machine learning history that intellectually uh, we were a bit of a small population leaving Africa. And it's very important that you have uh, people leading us in the right direction so that you don't become the Neanderthals. Uh, and, uh, David, by something that John, I think John Bridle said earlier, this idea of being a knight, uh, being able to clean the board quickly early in the game by moving sideways, and uh, that role is absolutely vital in that. But something that I th struck me that Richard had a slight sadness about, that I also have a sadness about, and other people don't, is not actually to have formally ever collaborated uh, with uh, David. So I'm expecting a very long paper to come out of this uh, uh, conference with all our names on it. <laughs> Um, but uh, if we could just thank all the speakers of uh, that session again and everyone who spoke today, I thought it was an excellent session. And then hand over to Christian for some announcements. So, 
um, speaking of guidance, I'm going to say a few things of where to find dinner tonight. So for all those who registered for the dinner, it'll be at Trinity College. We'll start with pre-dinner drinks at quarter past seven and dinner will be served from eight onwards. If you're not sure uh, for whatever reason that you're going to the dinner because you may not have registered or you may not have heard back, then please see either me, Oli or Zubin, but most of you should know. <laughs> um, I think that's it, and that concludes the session for today. Where, where are the drinks? Right. Um, where are they? <laughs> um, somewhere in Trinity. <laughs> Sorry? The porters will know. <laughs> um, just a couple more things about dinner. A few people have asked, is there a dress code? And no, it's, it's relaxed, so, you know, come as you like. And um, there is, uh, for those of you coming to the dinner, uh, the, it's, it's mostly free seating, but there'll be one table that will have uh, a list of people um, sitting at it. So. Okay, so I hope to see you, many, many of you at dinner and uh, all of you tomorrow morning. Yeah, we'll be back tomorrow morning at 9.30. Yeah.